There has been some exciting news related to Korea's entertainment industry in recent days as K-groups and K-productions expand their presence on the global stage and screen. So what are the prospects of a Brit Award for Blackpink this year? How are fans responding to news of Blackpink headlining Coachella this April? And what Korean movies have making headlines here and elsewhere? Welcome to Issues and Insiders. Today we touch upon the K-music, movies and dramas that have been making waves in recent days. For more, I have Bernie Joe, the head of DFSB Collective here in the studio. Mr. Joe, welcome back. Good to be back. Happy New Year. Right, Happy New Year to you too. I also have Professor Jay So at the Seoul Institute of the Arts joining us virtually. Professor So, it's a pleasure to see you again. Oh, nice to be back. Thanks for having me. Right. Mr. Joe, we'll start here in the studio. Let's begin with the significance of Blackpink's nomination for the International Group of the Year at this year's Brit Awards and the group's prospects, of course. Yes. Um, you know, I think for a lot of fans, uh, a lot of people actually probably didn't expect that Blackpink would be nominated in, in a European Music Award, specifically in the UK. Um, but they've been on a roll. I mean, they have one of the biggest tours of the year. Um, they, they shattered records on Spotify, on YouTube. And so for a lot of people, fans, critics alike, um, this is just merely just another candle on a huge cake they've been building for 2022, rolling into 2023. Um, but again, we have to take into consideration that in addition to winning big at the MTV Video Music Awards in New York City, they also won big not too long ago, a few months ago, in fact, at the MTV European Music Awards. And so for them to be nominated at one of the most prestigious uh, music award shows in the UK, it's, it's a big deal. Now, for a lot of fans who think that they can somehow, in some way, shape, or form, influence uh, the results, I, I, I hate to be the bearer of bad news. It, it looks like you could, but you actually can't because the Brit Awards is really interesting and unique in the sense that um, for the genre categories that are specific to celebrating UK artists from you know, major genres, be it rap or rock or dance music, et cetera, um, fans actually can vote online vis-a-vis -vis through Twitter and through TikTok and obviously through the Brit Awards website. So for a lot of fans, when they hear that and see that, it's, oh, we have a shot, we can do this. But it turns out for the international categories, whether it's international artist or international song or international group, uh, the nominees and more importantly, the winners are selected by a thousand uh, uh, member uh, panel of uh, music industry insiders, whether they be record label executives, uh, media executives, um, agents, and etc. This thousand member panel are the ones who are going to choose the ultimate winner. Um, and I'd like to think that Blackpink actually has a really good shot of winning. Um, when you look at who they're competing against, it's uh, Drake and 21 Savage um, from Canada and the US, so we'll call it North America. First Aid Kit, great name, um, from Sweden. The Fontaines DC from Ireland, which I was actually surprised. I was like, well, Ireland, UK, close enough. But, and then the Gabriels, which is a mix British um, and uh, American act. And so I think they have a real shot. And considering that Blackpink, you know, has just been selling out arenas and stadiums around the world, and particularly also in the UK, um, I'm willing to put a little money on that, that they're going to win. So right, hopefully. I, I, I can't say how much, though. <laughs> Mr. Joe, BTS, correct me if I'm wrong, BTS was nominated last year and the year before that as well, 2021 correct. and 2022. Right. But and they did not win. They did win. not win. And again, I think we have to um, realize that similar to the Grammy Awards, um, the Brit Awards for just the international categories, this is voted by industry insiders. And so given that um, fact, um, a lot of fans, um, I'm sorry to say, will have zero impact, zero influence on whether or not their favorite K-pop boy band or girl band will win. Right, much to their dismay then. Staying in Europe, Professor So, director Pyeon sang -hyun's Netflix production, Kill Pok Soon, has been invited to screen at the 73rd Berlin International Film Festival, which runs from February 16th to the 26th. Could you tell us a bit about this film? And I hear the invitation itself caught the director off guard. Yes, I heard that too. Um, well, it's directed by Pyeong Sung Yeon, who's a movie director, and this is his first Netflix, uh, you know, movie that he's producing, you know, directing. And basically, it's a, a movie about a female assassin who has a teenage daughter, and the as assassin is, you know, basically th this movie has Sal Gyeonggu, Kyoan, 
and uh, a lot of other, uh, you know, the most famous actor is Chun Doyon, who actually uh, won the Best Actress Award at Cannes Film Festival uh, years back. And so uh, there's a lot of buzz about this uh, film. And also the director, Byun Sang Yeon, who happens to be an stu ex-student of mine, uh, he graduated from Seoul Institute of the Arts. And uh, he's made movies like Merciless and Kingmaker. So he's kind of this up and coming new director. And so everybody's excited about this particular film. And I think um, like many movies right now, you know, because movies are hit really hard after uh, the COVID crisis, you know, the pandemic, um, people are still really looking towards, you know, Netflix and other OTT platforms to watch new uh, releases of movies. But they seem to be more, you know, series or drama driven. But this is like a standalone movie in itself. So Kilboksun is something that Netflix is really pumped. And I think everybody's really excited to watch it. And I think it's terrific that Berlin is the first uh, festival. It's one of the big three. Um, and uh, they'll be featuring this film. Right, and Chon do like you mentioned, she did win the uh, Cannes Award back in the year 2007, if I'm not wrong, for her role in Secret Sunshine. She's also, I understand, um, starring in a current uh, Netflix and TV and drama called Crash Course in Romance. Could you tell us a bit about that as well, Professor So? Yes, Chan do is an actress who, you know, basically he, she came to sort of the most famous sort of actress uh, of her time because of her, uh, the 60th, uh, Cannes Film Festival Best Actress for a movie called Secret Sunshine by Yi Chang Dong. And that kind of propelled her pr uh, career forward. But she's been acting for a very long time. Um, her first roles were on television dramas back in the early 90s. I think it was 92 when she first started. And uh, she moved over to film a little bit later in 97 with a movie called Contact, which is one of Korea's like, you know, really famous movies. It's kind of a romance uh, movie at the time and she made a splash in the movie uh, situation there but now she's really famous for a lot of uh, series that she's come out in and you know like some of the you know they're mostly romance bittersweet relationships and things like that and I think it's really terrific to watch her in Crash Course in Romance because this is a series uh, you know she plays a uh, a little like restaurant shop owner who, you know, basically a lot of the people around there is about sort of Korea's sort of really competitive college entrance exam students. And so the drama's right there. And so she is now kind of older. Uh, she kind of plays more of a matronly role. And uh, but uh, she's always played sort of the sweetheart. She's she has an image of being somebody that's very versatile in her acting. So she can play both a bad person and also a really, you know, basically virtuous person as well. And, and uh, she's been kind of a favorite uh, amongst Koreans, but I think she's now more internationally renowned um, as an actress because of uh, all the attention she got from Cannes Film Festival. Right. And Mr. Joe, back on Blackpink, the group itself, it's poised to um, headline. It's the first K-pop act, actually, to headline the Coachella Valley Music and Arts Festival this April. Simply speaking, what are the implications of this particular invitation to headline well, the let, show itself? We probably need to a little bit unwind and unpack the semantics. They're not the first K-pop act to ever perform at Coachella. That honor actually goes to a uh, indie uh, punk electronic band called EE. -E. But soon after EE, -E, um, other Korean bands started to make it on the lineup. Uh, unfortunately, they were usually slotted in the early afternoon slots on a Sunday. But over time, bands like Epic High or Jambanai started making uh, inroads. And then actually, Blackpink, they debuted in the US in 2019 at Coachella, and they created a huge sensation. So it got everyone's attention in the industry. So yeah, they were on the poster, and they actually performed on one of the main stages, actually at a, at a pretty good time, around dinner time. But I remember the excitement that people had. Like, oh, wow, the, these girls are going to go big. And then now fast forward now to 2023. Um, they're not one of the biggest ads by virtue of being one of the headliners. And there's only three of them. It's Bad Bunny, who is easily and arguably the biggest artist in the world right now. Uh, Frank Ocean, who's making a huge comeback. And again, Blackpink. And so that by them being one of the, not A, but the headliners, that's basically telling the world these acts and Blackpink are currently probably one of the top three artists right now in the world that everybody wants to see live. Um, they're scheduled to play not one, but two weekends, um, April 14th through the 16th, and again on April 21st through the 23rd. 
Um, and so for those of you who want to get tickets, you better get them now because they're going to sell out very quickly. But it's going to be huge. And I think um, they're going to easily live up to all the expectations because unlike their 2019 debut, you know, they just had an EP and a few singles. Now um, they have a few um, EPs, albums under their belt. And then more importantly, each of the members of Blackpink have all during their um, during this time have had very successful solo releases, solo hits, solo songs. And so mix that all up and then bringing their, you know, right now just red hot, super hot world tour to, which is arguably a very hot Coachella in uh, California. It's, it's gonna be a huge highlight and it's gonna be um, something that uh, I can comfortably and confidently say I'll, I'll probably be there. <laughs> right, lucky you. But Mr. Joseph, I, again, how do you explain Blackpink's success on the international arena? Oh boy, if I try to answer this question, I'm not going to make anybody happy, but I'll give it a go. Um, I think with Blackpink, um, you know, obviously their music is great, but I think we have to look at um, not just the content, but really the context that is bundled and wrapped around with um, Blackpink. Obviously, coming out of one of the, um, the biggest and one of the best Korean music management companies, YG Entertainment, right off the bat, you know, tremendous training. But what I've noticed about Blackpink in terms of how they were able to go to the next level, really to the top level, um, there are a few things that I, I look at is, um, in addition to obviously the individual members being talented and them being very good as a team, you look at the team that's supporting Blackpink, the band. Um, you know, currently right now, when it comes to um, their major releases in major markets, um, they've teamed up with Interscope, one of the major labels at Universal Music, who have obviously helped them go to the next level. Um, when we look at them booking, um, you know, these festival gigs, uh, you know, they're represented by one of the top talent agencies currently um, in the world in the music space, Wasserman. Um, and then just the fact that um, AEG is currently producing their world tour, AEG also happens to own and operate Coachella. Um, and then again, we take into consideration, if we look at 2022, the body of work that these women have put together has just utterly been absolutely phenomenal. Um, they've broken records on Spotify. They've shattered records on YouTube. Um, again, unfortunately, although they got snubbed at the Grammy Awards, other awards were more than happy to give them not one, but multiple trophies. And then we look at some of the collaborations. I mean, you have now not just artists like Lady Gaga wanting to team up with them or um, Selena Gomez wanting to sing with them collaborations in the fashion space. I mean, each of those women represent one of arguably some of the hottest fashion brands in the world. And so when you look at Blackpink right now, they're not just one of the hottest girl bands, they're one of the hottest bands right now at the moment. And I think Coachella and this, um, you know, uh, tapping of them to be one of the top three headliners is a testament to what a year they've had and, and what a, a bigger year they're, they're likely to have in 2023. Right, I see. Meanwhile, back on the screens, Professor, so director Yeon Sang-ho's Jung-hee, it's supposed to debut on Netflix this Friday, and the cast marked its press conference with a tribute to late Kang Soo-yeon. Could you tell us a bit about this tragic loss in the local film industry here and about the film jung itself? Well, uh, jung is a kind of a sci-fi movie that's coming out on Netflix, and, and Yeon Sang-ho, you know, he's, he's famous for Train to Busan, and also he um, basically he made the the really popular series Hell as well, um, and this is a this new Chang is about a, an apocalyptic future like dystopian future where AI labs are leading an effort to end a civil war by cloning. So there's all this stuff, and Kang Soo Hyun, uh, one of the most famous actresses in Korean cinema, uh, is one of the main characters. She's a scientist in this, and unfortunately she passed away last year um, uh, suddenly. Um, and uh, fortunately for the production, I think maybe if they have a second season, she won't re be returning, but they wrapped production on the, on the film last year in January. So um, unfortunately, she will be featured uh, posthumously in this series, uh, which will, is starting really soon this month. And, you know, about Kang soo she began her, she was like a child actress that started um, in Korean cinema and uh, in basically in context surrogate woman. She was like, I think she was in her teens in 1987. She won the Volpe Cup for Best Actress at the 44th Venice International Film Festival for a role. And after that, 
all the cinema in Korea from the 80s, 90s, it was Kang Seon was almost a major actress in all of these movies, playing everything from a romantic lead to a you know somebody that's like an evil person to a virtuous person. And she did comic roles. She was basically synonymous with Korean cinema of like the 90s, and then her career kind of slowed down in the early 2000s. And uh, she started picking back up again towards 2010. And unfortunately, I, I kind of know a little about uh, a bit about her because she was such a famous person. She uh, took over the the Busan International Film Festival as the festival director. Um, but at the time when it was very politically un, unsound in a sense, and so she was attacked by a lot of film people at the time, sort of really ignorantly. And I think it really damaged her soul a little bit. So I find it really tragic that such a famous act. Chris is uh, has gone too soon. She was basically, you know, in her fifties when she died, and and uh, nobody really saw this coming. So it's a kind of a tragedy. But I think Chang is going to be sort of a, a real chance for audiences to see what a great actress she is. And um, you know, it's, I think it's like maybe the first movie she's coming out in the sci-fi as as the main lead. So I'm really looking forward to the series Chang Yi. Right, and it's on debuting on Netflix this Friday. Beyond the small screen, Professor, onto the silver screen. Starting today is director Lee Young's Phantom. Again, could you share a brief synopsis for those who have yet to decide what to watch this long weekend to mark Seolal, including right. myself? This, right, Seolal is you know one of the major holidays. I, I think it would be akin to like you know Chinese New Year, like a really big um, holiday. So. Basically, movie theaters are all geared um, in the past to show a lot of movies, but of course, you know, because of the COVID crisis, uh, you know, a lot of the streaming services really took over. But we're really looking forward to Lee Young's new film, Phantom, and this is based on basically it's kind of a retelling of a historical drama of the Japanese imperial period uh, set in 1933 in Korea, where it's a assassination attempt on a Japanese sort of. Ambassador to China that kind of went wrong, and so it's kind of a who done it type of a story. And again, the you know when we started this, the 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 talk today, you know we had Sargunga in in the movie uh, that's happening on on Netflix for Pyeong Sang Yeon, and here he stars again. And we have Park Hae Soo, who everybody knows from Squid Game, um, coming out in this. So um, there's a lot of interesting details. Um, it's it's a retelling of a, sort of like what could have happened. Um, if, if certain things historically went in a different direction. And uh, Park Hae Su plays like a, a Japanese sort of, um, you know, basically soldier in it, uh, an officer, and he's really the bad guy in this uh, series again. And so I think it's kind of really interesting. His uh, acting has really gone from, you know, basically playing a romantic lead. He was also in, you know, Money Heist series as a bad guy there as well. So he really shows a lot of range. And then Seol Gyeonggu is like one of the most famous, uh, you know, Korean actors as well. So and uh, director Lee is somebody else. So I'd, I'd like to point out that as a graduate of the Seoul Institute of the Arts where I teach. And uh, he started out act actually in uh, commercials, directing commercials, and then he really uh, made his inroads into making, uh, you know, feature films for that. So there's a, um, a Believer was like the movie in 2019 action movie that he did. So many fans of Lee Young and also Seol Gyeong Gu and Park Hae Soo are really looking forward to this history. Historical drama. Right, and maybe I'll watch it as well. Uh, back on the music front, uh, Mr. Cho, the last time we spoke, we talked about uh, Big Bang Taeyang's single collaboration with BTS's Jimin. What has been the response from fans and critics alike with regard to this collaboration? Oh, I, th I think the answer is pretty obvious. Fans love it, critics love it, um, and, uh, you know, no pun intended, the vibe on this song. I mean, I listened to it on the way here. I watched the video while I was getting prepared here. I mean, this is um, a huge, massive hit, and the numbers don't lie um, already. It's on hundreds of playlists around the world on all the top music services in Korea, outside of Korea, across Asia, beyond Asia. Um, but when we look at um, the Apple iTunes chart, um, it debuted as the number one worldwide global single. And according to the Black Label, which now currently represents Taeyang, um, apparently that single debuted at number one on over 60 countries around the world. And again, you know, um, with YouTube, uh, from last time I checked, it was over 40 million views in just four days of the song and the video. 
And so, yeah, it's safe to say that um, both Taeyang with Big Bang and obviously uh, Jimin of BTS have uh, lived up to their expectations and have continued their trajectory on their track record of just having massive global hits. Um, the song is great. I mean, I think that uh, what I would love to see is, in some ways, that combination of Taeyang and Jimin in some ways reminds me of when Bruno Mars and um, Anderson Peck got together and did Silk Sonic and, and it took them, they, they cleaned up all the awards. So I, I really hope and maybe a little bit, maybe pray that this superstar tandem duo um, can hopefully find some uh, hardware uh, similar to uh, Silk Sonic, but it's a great song. It's a great video and um, yeah, kudos and praise to those guys. Well done. Right, I have to agree with you there. Also, much to the delight of fans, Professor, so Apple TV Plus's Pachinko was granted this year's Critics' Choice Award for Best Foreign Language Series. Now, this would be Korea's second, marking that would be after uh, last year's win by Squid Game. Is this critical acclaim, Professor, so tangible proof, perhaps, of Korea's remarkable strides uh, in screen productions to perhaps better cater to a global audience now? Well, ever since, uh, you know, Bong Joon-ho's win with uh, Parasite, it's every year there's been a Korean, you know, oriented film, like Korean themed film, you know, it was Minari the next year, then we had Squid Game win. Um, also, last year, decision to leave one best director for Park chan at the, you know, Cannes Film Festival. And Pachinko winning the Critics' Choice for Best uh, Foreign Language Film is another great honor. So it's in a series of of events and the the what's really interesting about this series is it's based on a, a bestseller New York Times bestseller book called uh, Pachinko by uh, Min Jin Lee and uh, the directors are uh, Justin Chun who's an, a former actor and Koga Naga who's also a Korean uh, director who directed movies like After Yang and this series has been sort of the talk of the town it's actually even though it's based in Japan about a Korean J Japanese family um, it's considered sort of like the hit of uh, American sort of um, uh, series because it was produced by Apple Plus. And uh, this, you know, beat out a lot of really great um, different series in this category. For example, I think Extraordinary Attorney Wu, which is like another big hit in Korea, was also nominated in this category. And then Oregon or uh, 1899 or Garcia. Uh, Clio, these are really strong series that it beat out. So I think it really showed that um, the quality, the direction, the acting, um, everything about it. And also, you know, it, it has Yoon Jung who won um, Best uh, Supporting Actress for uh, Minari um, in the Academy Awards. And also it has Lee Min who's like a really big actor as well. So uh, Pachinko is definitely something that I would say it's it's one of those tentpole movies for Apple TV plus like you know a series so uh, a success of a series uh, really shows when they renew the contract for a second season and um, it was an eight-part series that started in April last year and uh, it's been renewed for a second season so I think um, we're really looking forward to the next season of, of uh, Pachinko and it, it it's a really sprawling drama um, and it had like a hundred million dollar budget it was it was a, a period piece along with sort of like you know moving through time to modern times as well so I, I'm really looking forward to and, and I agree with you I think it's setting a trend for all of Korean content um, basically being recognized around the world Right, but there's a lot to look forward to this spring, along with that, as well as the Coachella that Mr. Joe spoke about as well. Uh, right, well, on that note, I think we're going to end today's edition. Mr. Joe, as always, thank you very much for your time and your thoughts today. And Professor So, thank you very much for your insights. My pleasure. Right, well, that is all the time we have for this edition of Issues and Insiders. Thank you for watching. We'll see you same time on Thursday.